It is day two of the World Economic Forum and the globe's richest and most powerful have co congregated at the picturesque town of Davos in Switzerland. My colleague Shireen Ban is in Davos and she has been getting us exclusive conversations with the biggest names in corporate India. She caught up with Anand Mahindra, the chairman of the Mahindra Group, earlier in the day. He told her that Mahindra Group finds continued value in being together and hence will not spin off the tractor business into a separate entity. That's not all. Mahindra also reiterated that he believed that the Mahindra Group was a federation and not a conglomerate and added that they were focusing on finding new ways to strengthen governance. I think by now analysts have grudgingly acknowledged that we seem to have found some way in which we can make this theoretically unwieldy uh, conglomeration of businesses work. Don't forget this is not a conglomerate. It's a federation. It's a federation. Thank you very much for remembering <laughs> that. And you know, GE, uh, I don't hold GE out as an example anymore. I always used to differentiate us from GE because okay. GE is a conglomerate. Oh. But the federation philosophy, if anything, Shirin, mm. is strengthening. And every year we find new mechanisms to, to strengthen governance. Governance is the number one mm. glue of a federation. And I don't have to tell you governance is the number one issue in large corporations mm -hmm. globally. Mm -hmm. If you look at the number of executives who are behind bars today, the thin line between good governance and bad governance is something that people are finding hard to manage. Including a former partner of yours, Carlos Ghosn. Um, I, didn't, uh, I don't take names of anybody, but I think the signs are all around us that governance has got to be the hallmark of groups uh, mm. like us. Even Renault and Nissan were a group. Mm. So it is possible to nurture and to build diverse businesses. I think the biggest opportunity for us, which mm. we've demonstrated, is that new business opportunities lie in the intersections of these businesses. Mm. What we are finding is our biggest opportunities come when one business says, hey, you know, I need this done here, but mm. I think you can do it. Mm. Whether it's Mahindra Logistics doing people mobility yeah. for the auto sector. Yeah. There are hundreds I could go on. So mm. I am not done with that model. I think we've done well. Uh, in terms of locking on whole value, uh, and this is speculation, I don't know if there is any truth to it or not, but would you consider the possibility of spinning off the tractor business into a separate entity? You know, uh, we are, these kinds of questions are not new. They're not something that we look at in stealth. There are questions about value and about business strategy and is there a value and merit in auto is and there? farm? We are still together, which no, means... in terms of splitting it up. No, is there, we are finding continued value in being together. If you look at anybody, I was just in, a, in another interview just now where people were asking about scale. You know that every auto business, every mobility business in the world is looking at scale. We have scale because if you look at the auto and farm businesses, the things they share at the back end mm or the things they share in human resources, in procurement, in R&D, in co-location, those kinds of synergies you don't give up easily. Mm. Other people are scrounging to find them. Mm. So yes, there could be a bit, a bit of a pop if you say I'm going to separate this in order to get a higher PE. We're players for the long term. Mm. Shireen also caught up with Rajesh Gopinathan, the CEO of TCS. He believes that the IT sector is not really experiencing a talent crunch, but a lack of right people in the right job. The TCS CEO also said that they were doubling its talent development to meet the demand in the future. Take a look. Definitely the mood is uh, one of introspection. I, don't, I wouldn't put the mood as one being very optimistic uh, compared to the... What are they introspecting about? This whole aspect of globalization 4.0 and the fact that we need to find what they're calling the new architecture, mm. um, I think the problems are well understood. Uh, the solutions, the basic solutions are yet to be fully uh, understood. Mm -hmm. um, but the good thing is that uh, it's very clear that uh, the solution is going to come by betting on the human spirit. Right. And if you think about it, it's one space that uh, whether we take, take TCS or India in general, huh. we have been fairly good at it in terms of uh, betting on people and skilling people mm. in being able to bring people up to participate in mm. the jobs of the future mm. and to make them ready for the global labor pool. And that's where the real issue is and the challenge is and a lot of the dialogue is happening on that space. You know, since you talk about talent, one of the issues that you're faced with is a talent crunch and that has also negatively impacted your margins because of the subcontracting work that's happened. Uh, is this now a structural increase that we're going to have to get used to? Uh, we'll have to wait and see how the solutions come out. Actually, if you look at a lot of the dialogue happening here, it's not that the jobs are not there. It is that the right talent for the right mm. job is not yeah. there. 
and that has been our focus. As we said, we are uh, um, supply constrained on the opportunities that are there and the geopolitics of it is not uh, helping it. So definitely in the short term, uh, we are going to see some amount of impact on it as we continue to invest in uh, capturing the demand that is there mm. and probably uh, invest in creating talent which is going to take a lot more time mm. uh, than the immediate ones. But we are very, very optimistic about the long-term focus on technology mm. and the uh, long-term visibility on demand. And uh, hence we are doubling down on uh, our uh, talent uh, development, both uh, in India as well as in our overseas uh, theatres. From Davos to all the action on the Lal Street, the benchmark indices saw a sharp sell-off after ITC posted a slight miss in its third quarter earnings. Let's bring the charts up for you. The Nifty and the Sensex tanked about 1%. The Nifty managed to hold on to that 10,800 mark, while the Sensex ended above the 36,100 mark. Bank Nifty shed over 230 points, dragged by SBI, Kotak and HDFC Bank. The mid-caps, however, slightly outperformed today, with that index ending flat with a slight negative bias. And in earnings action, FMCG giant ITC reported a healthy set of numbers for the third quarter. The company met street expectations on both the profit and the revenue front. However, there was a marginal miss on the margins front. Cigarette volumes too appear in line with expectations. And Interglobe Aviation reported a 75% drop in the third quarter profits, but the operational performance or turnaround of sorts, the airline saw 28% growth in revenues, hitting nearly 8,000 crore rupees with a profit of 190 crore rupees. More importantly, though, margins have recovered to a 21% from just 3.6% in the second quarter. Yields for the company have also risen 3.7% to 3.83%. Morgan Stanley Investment Management's Richie Sharma believes that a major economic slowdown is unfolding in the United States. In an exclusive interaction with CNBC, Richie Sharma also said that the global markets have been underestimating China's slowdown concerns. He also talked about the convergence in interest rates of China and US and warned that a rate cut in China will pose a threat to the Chinese currency. Take a look. Talking about a complete recession out here in the US, but a major slowdown unfolding as the stimulus measures fade. But I also feel that the interlinkages are seriously underestimated compared to what they used to be. I mean, in late 2015, early 2016, when you did get a very serious global slowdown, it did impact the US much more until the Chinese were able to do a massive stimulus and that helped global growth, including US growth. So I don't sort of agree with this very insular argument that the US is going to sort of remain completely protected by these great oceans and, you know, like it'll continue to sort of ride its own theme. I personally feel that the risks are really there uh, in China. The, like all the reports from the ground suggest that a very serious slowdown is underway. And the more sort of um, worrying aspect is that there's really not that much that they can do out here because U.S. interest rates and Chinese interest rates now have converged. Um, and for them to cut interest rates further from here to stimulate the economy, poses a very serious risk to the currency and they don't want that to flare up as well. So it puts them in a much tighter spot than they have been in the three other instances this decade when they have rolled out a massive stimulus. GST collections for December may remain subdued. We learn that the collections will likely hover around that 95,000 crore rupee mark. Remember, this is lower than the government's projection of about 1 lakh crore rupee collections per month. Timsi Jaipuria has all the details. Timsi, what are you picking up? Well, it is a worrisome picture emerging just before budget. What I understand from sources is the fact that GST collections for the month of December are likely to remain subdued, that too in the range of 94 to 96,000 odd crore rupees. If you see the fiscal so far, it was only in the month of September when the collections crossed the magical 1 lakh crore rupee mark. However, the asking rate continues to be 1.15 lakh crore rupees and government has already admitted that attaining the 1 lakh crore rupee mark is what, is, what their agenda is. They are not looking at the asking rate as the monthly average to be attained uh, as of now because GST is still under this stabilizing stage. Also, this time the decline is an impact of two things. Firstly, the rate correction that was announced on December 22nd and secondly, the decline in demand. However, if you see the pre-GST era, uh, December, Jan, Feb and March are the four months which are very crucial when it comes to revenue collections because these are the most yielding months for, uh, for when it comes to the revenue trends. 
Also, if you see uh, yesterday itself, we saw high-powered GOM uh, uh, tasked by GST Council on revenue augmentation met yesterday itself under the chairmanship of Sushil Modi, who is Deputy CM of Bihar, to try and look into ways and means to augment revenue collections. CBIC also on its part has started taking steps and measures to monitor revenue collections on a weekly basis. CBIC chairman has recently written to all its uh, ta top tax officials to look into ways and means to augment revenue collections. However, let's see what happens finally on 1st of Feb when this, re this number will be officially reported and that too being the budget day. Let's see what happens on 1st of Feb. Back to you. Absolutely, Tim C. Thank you so much for those details. On to a CNBC TV 18 exclusive news break. SBI Chairman Rajneesh Kumar is all set to meet SEBI Chief Ajay Tyagi to discuss Etihad's revival proposal for the cash-strapped jet airways. Remember, Etihad had already listed out a set of demands to infuse 35 million into the debt-laden carrier. But Etihad has put out certain conditions. Now, the company says that it will not pay more than 1,500 rupees per share and will end jet privileges exclusivity with jet airways. It also says that it wants Jet Airways to pledge its 49.9% holding in Jet Privilege. The national company Law Appellate Tribunal has directed the NCLT's Ahmedabad bench to pass an order on SR Steel's resolution plan by the 31st of this month. Remember, Arcelor Mittal, with an upfront payment of 42,000 crore rupees, has already emerged as the highest bidder for the debt-laden steel giant. They had also moved the NCLAT seeking a quicker decision in the case. The Ruyas too have submitted a resolution plan seeking to withdraw the company from insolvency by offering over 4,000 crore rupees to the lenders. Now, the NCLAT directed the NCLT to rule on both ArcelorMittal's offer and the maintainability of Ruya's offer before the 4th of February. This is also not the first time that the Appellate Tribunal has directed the NCLT to move on this case expeditiously. The NCLAT had passed a similar order in the first week of this month. Today, a two-member bench of the NCLAT said that if the NCLT does not pass any order by the end of the month, then it would call the matter and pass an order according on the next date of hearing. Meanwhile, SBI is likely to extend the deadline for the sale of its SR Steel loans after the NCLATs. SBI will not go ahead with e-bidding for SR Steel exposure on the 30th of January as it was originally planned. Ritu Singh is joining us with more details. Ritu? In what comes as a very important development in the sale of SR Steel loans by State Bank of India, we understand from sources that now with the NCLAT ruling in place, which has directed NCLT to expedite the orders, uh, you know, in the SR Steel insolvency case by the 31st of January, and if uh, you know NCLT fails to do so by the 4th of Feb, NCLAT will transfer the case to itself. There is a fresh a lease of hope amongst the lenders that perhaps resolution will be found for SR Steel by the 4th of February, and therefore we understand that State. Bank of India will take a call on the sale of SR Steel loans only after the 4th of February deadline. Uh, do remember 23rd of January is when uh, you know the EOIs had to be submitted and 30th of January is when the e-bidding was to be conducted but now we understand that SBI has scrapped the e-bidding at least for the 30th of January. That said there was sufficient interest in buying out the asset uh, you know Edelweiss Asset Reconstruction Company, SSG Capital, SC Lowy, uh, Deutsche Bank, Goldman Sachs, Kotak Mahindra Bank. These are just some of the uh, several 18 to 20 EOIs that had been submitted but you know there is a concern among many of these buyers about the clawback option that was included in the bid and that is something we understand that SBI is willing to relook at if at all it restarts this process of the sale of SR steel loans. All right, Ritu, thank you so much for those details. Now, latest from the deal space, HDFC Life Insurance could be rekindling its deal talks with Max Life. Speaking to CNBC TV 18, HDFC Life CEO Vibha Padalkar said that the company's outlook towards Max hasn't changed. However, she did not deny or confirm that the buzz that the two sides have had restarted negotiations. Take a look. So, more broadly referring to it, we uh, remain interested in inorganic growth. We have the currency um, and uh, we will continue to evaluate every opportunity that comes our way. Particularly with Max Life. Max Life is a great franchise and nothing has changed as far as our outlook towards them. On to the big political development this evening, Priyanka Gandhi Vadra has finally entered active politics just months ahead of the crucial Lok Sabha polls. She will debut as the party's general secretary with charge of Eastern Uttar Pradesh. Remember, this part of UP has constituencies of BJP's top mascots like Prime Minister Narendra Modi and UP Chief Minister Yogi Adityanath. Let's go across to Parikshit Lutra for more on this story. Parikshit, 
Will Priyanka's entry help the Congress party overcome this massive challenge that is posed by the BJP and the SP-BSP alliance in Uttar Pradesh? You know, ever since the uh, 2014 Lok Sabha polls, my source in the Congress party have been telling us that uh, Priyanka Gandhi would be a trump card for the Congress and they would take out that trump card at a suitable time. And I guess the Congress party feels that that suitable time has now come. She had been helping Sonia Gandhi and Rahul Gandhi in the family bastions of Amethi and Raibareli for, for many years now, since uh, 2004. But now it seems that the Congress felt that it was the right time to motivate the Kada by throwing her into one of the toughest regions in India, the Purvalchal region, eastern UP region of Uttar Pradesh, which has Ayodhya, Gorakhpur and Varanasi. So just imagine she's taking on the Prime Minister, she's also taking on the Chief Minister, Yogi Adityanath, and also she's fighting uh, the BJP in the very crucial constituency of Ayodhya. This entire region has about 28 seats. Her contribution will be extremely crucial. What we'll now have to wait and see is uh, whether... Uh, Priyanka Gandhi will actually fight this election as well electorally. Motivating the Kada, choosing the candidates, campaigning across the country is one thing, but will she fight? In fact, sources have been telling us that it's quite possible that she may fight from uh, the family bastion of Raibareli because Sonia Gandhi's health has not been up to the mark. Her health has been a concern for, uh, for several months, several years now, and it's possible that at the last stage, uh, the Congress may make an announcement and Priyanka Gandhi may finally fight that election from Raibareli. All right, Riksha, thank you so much for those details. Now on to the latest on the controversy of the recent appointments made by the Supreme Court. Justice Madan Lokur, who retired from the Supreme Court on the 30th of December, has pitched for some tweaks to the collegium system for the appointment of Supreme Court judges. He also expressed dissatisfaction over the fact that the SC collegium's recommendation to appoint Justice Rajendra Menon and Justice Pradeep Nandrajog was not published and slammed government for sitting on the appointment of judges when it's not convenient for it. Remember, Justice Lokur was a part of the collegium when that decision was made. If, if, uh, if the High Court Collegium makes a recommendation and says that uh, you know we think that uh, so and so should be appointed as a judge, and the state government does not respond, all right, or does not act upon that recommendation within a period of six weeks, then the government of India, the law ministry or the Department of Justice, where it is concerned can proceed on the assumption that they have no objection. Okay? Now, supposing the uh, government of India or the law ministry or the uh, Department of Justice does not proceed on that assumption, what happens? And supposing the government sits on the file for months together, it sat on the file of um, uh, Justice K.M. Joseph for months together? That's right. What do you do? The memorandum of procedure is silent on that. Now. What, what, what do you expect uh, anybody to do? Perhaps just, you know, maybe the Chief Justice to ring up to find out what's happening. You know, apart from that, what else? They will say, yeah, the file is with us, we process it. Everybody knows that, uh, you know, uh, the government has been sitting on some files. It's, it's a matter of public knowledge. It's not something to do with my being a member of the collegium or not. Everybody knows it. Files have remained pending for a couple of months. Everybody knows it. With that, it is a wrap on this edition of Reporters Diary. Many thanks for watching, but stay tuned to CNBC TV 18. Our special show, Making of Amravati, Andhra Pradesh's new capital, is coming up next.